hope recording is good. Okay, got it. Fine. So I still got a bigger one of you, Ibby, and a little one of me. So um, if I put myself on, oh, that's it. Yeah, okay, I've got a big one of me now, then I can see what I'm doing. Great. Okay, so what we're going to do tonight is look at four different levels of technique, elementary, um, lower intermediate, and then after that, in between that and the next two levels, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how I came to invent, if you like, um, a technical syllabus and what the reasoning was behind that and, and how we did it. And then we're going to look at um, intermediate technique and upper intermediate technique. And this is just what I did um, at, at the time. And after every level, I'm going to invite you to ask me some questions. You don't, you don't have to, but sometimes things just come up, don't they? And you think, well, actually, it'd be really useful just to say this now. So we've got four levels of technique and please feel free to ask questions. So, so let's start with this first piece then, it's the brawl. Let's play that together. What I want to do is play the pieces and then we'll discuss the technique. So, um, and Ibi's gonna put up a sheet, I think, of, of points that I think we, we want to look at, uh, but let's just play it first. So has everybody got their vial ready? I'm presuming that's a yes, because it's like teaching on Zoom and teaching the invisible person. Um, okay, so we're going to put both on strings. I'm going to go sort of not, not too quick. I'm going to go one, two, three, four. Here we go then. And three, four. <laughs> oh, I forgot to say, sorry. Um, there's a repeat missing. Sorry about this. In the second line, um, uh, just before the end of the last bar, there should be a repeat. And um, I've also forgot to say that tenors, um, some of the technique that I'm going to talk about isn't going to be relevant for you. Because what I've done, I've re-transposed uh, this so we're all playing in G. Um, of course, if it was for tenor, it would be upper fourth. Um, and a technique would make more sense. Um, but it's it's not fun playing in parallel fourths on Zoom. So tenors, you're, you're on the same pitch. Okay, can we do that again now? Okay, here we go. And three. complications but let's just have a look at some of the things if you can you get this sheet up of the elementary technique we've got the 10 points there um, just while he's doing that I will uh, mention the first thing so a very basic technique um, is holding fingers across the strings oh that's the last one uh, can we have page oh yeah here we go yeah so we've got 10 things here to think about and um, so the first one is they're holding that I want to look at anyway. I don't want to do all 10 of them. We'll be here for years. Um, but I'm um, holding fingers down across the strings. So when we play G, A, B, um, we're holding fingers down. And, and that as a basic concept is perhaps one of the most important things you can do when you're holding fingers down across strings. Um, and play with dynamics. So mm, this is an interesting one, isn't it? So we just got a bow on the string. We're doing very elementary things and already I'm saying play with dynamics and and this has quite a bit to do with the next point as well be aware of bow distribution and how much bow you use for each note so um let's say we're playing in crotchets and we know that our bow we could say is worth a semi brief in a very simple way half the bow is a minimum so a quarter of it is a, 
a crotchet. So we're going to be playing at the tip in crotchets. When we come to the minims, play more bow and then less bow. So this is a very basic concept, isn't it? And remember this, because I'm going to come back to it. Um, so when we've got our bow distribution and we've worked out that we're playing that much bow with a crotchet, we then have a crescendo. So everything that I've just said about bow, bow distribution goes out the window, because if you want to play a louder note, you're going to play with more bow. And that, again, is a very basic concept that at this level is, is really good to think about. So the first two bars then, you can hear the crescendo just by using bow speed. And this, don't worry, this does get more complex. <laughs> We're not just gonna do an easy piece um, all evening. Um, so let's play this piece again. Um, oh, and number 10 on each of the lists I've got here is always playing with a good tone. So how do you do that if you're thinking about your left hand all the time? Because you're thinking, well, I don't know what note I'm on. Where every time I start playing, my bow does this. And, you know, and my tone goes out the window when I go onto the top string. So let's just think about this a minute, shall we? If, if that is happening, then you think, well, actually, I need a bit more practice with the right hand. So how do I get practice with the right hand if I'm playing the left hand as well? Well, don't play with the left hand. So if we were to play this piece without the left hand, we just play the string that the note is on, it would go like this. That's just the first two bars. And that is a concept, a practicing tool is, is really quite a good idea. It can be a bit complex to start with, because you're thinking so much about which, which note, which string the note is on, that you're thinking, what am I doing with my bow? But even if you did it for a couple of bars, I'll just do it again. So the G is on the E string, open A, B is on the A string. And that's going to give me a little bit of a chance to think, right, what is my right hand doing? If I can do this without the left hand, then put it together and then do it slowly. Holding my fingers down, then the bow will stay, stay put. That's just one way of practicing. Let's play this again then. Put the dynamics in, hold the fingers down, and um, have a good tone. Okay. So not too quick either, because I think we need to, to realize that um, at this level, we're not going to be playing quickly. We're going to be playing carefully with a good tone. Yeah? Okay, here we go. So, three, four. <laughs> sense then that you were using more bow as you did your crescendo and that you were holding your fingers down. Does anybody have any questions before we move on to the next level? Okay, let's move on. So this is lower intermediate and it covers two of my books. So we've got two lots of, um, of technique to look at here in two different lists. Um, and I think one of the most important things um, at this stage, because we've established a good hand position in the elementary level, and I think it's really important that whatever you've done in the elementary level, you continue in the next level on. Oh, 
Um, okay. Don't worry, if you do want to go back to me, then I we can we can do this in a minute. Actually, no, no, stay. No, actually, don't worry. <laughs> okay. So um one of let me just talk you through the technique of this first and then we'll play it and and then uh, and we'll play it again. So first of all, um for the next piece we've got caudal fingering, which which I put here because I thought caudal fingering again is something like holding your fingers down is something that's really important to keep the resonance of the vial going. Um, and we've also got in this piece, we've got notes on the fourth string. Now, on the on the treble and the and the bass, we've got C D E F, and on the tenor, we've got G A, um, sorry, F G A B flat. And you know, playing these notes on the fourth string at this stage, it's just like planting a seed. It's it's knowing where those notes are. We we know that F natural is on the first fret, fret and it's, it sounds so much nicer than the F on the C string. But knowing where they are at this stage is, I I think, in my opinion, is 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 really quite important because sometimes you will need to use them. And if you've come across it before early on, then you'll know where they are. And some. Sometimes using F on the um, F on the C string, that fourth finger on the fourth string can really get you out of some really nasty holes. Okay, um, the next thing in this level is to be able to play quavers with a little bit of wrist movement. So that's presuming that your arm is nice and relaxed, and that the bow is relaxed in the bow hold, and that the the wrist is able to move fluidly. And and having you know being aware of arm weight and all that um, is something to, that can make your help you move your wrist. So so what happens when you first start to move your wrist on the bow? Uh, well, something like this, isn't it? Because your wrist wants to go in one direction, your bow wants to go another. So just doing wrist movement at this stage um, on quavers just seems to be an important part of technique. We're not doing it all the time. Um, not, not expecting to do it all the time, just on those little notes. It's more like being aware of having a heavy arm and, and movement in the wrist rather than thinking, well, I'm doing a push here and I'm doing a pull there. It's just that it's a general fluidity that that can, can come across at this level. Um, and of course, we've got bow parallel to the bridge, particularly on the top string. Mm. And the first level, we did that with a D. We play the ball. Um, and in this this next piece, we're going up up the D string. And again, it's it is sort of partly have, all about having a beautiful tone on this top string. And and when you play with the viol in the right place, it can have a huge effect on on your arm and and, and where it and, and where it is on the top string. So you can see I've got my bass turned in. Um, so you're looking at me here and my bass is over there. And so my, my arm on the top string is quite relaxed. If I'm putting my vial here, can you see I have to contort my body and come forward. And then when you do the same for treble, playing on the top string on the treble is also something that's really important and getting that beautiful sound on the top string and the bow parallel to the bridge all the time. Um, I've just realized I haven't checked something on this. Original sound, I think, I think we said original sound on, oh, didn't we, not off. Does that sound better? Did sounds you? good, sounds yeah, good. Does that, does that sound better than off? Well, you were playing bass earlier, but this, this sounds good. Okay. And it, it was okay before, Jackie. It was oh, fine. Okay, well, let me just do bass. Hang on. I'm sure we said sound on. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so um, you can see how playing on the top string, I know I, I used to look at students play down here, and then they, when, when they play the top string, they very soon move their instrument, but getting it in the right place now is quite important. So playing up here at this stage, I think is quite important. So let's let's play through this piece, the fanfare. Um, one thing I've forgotten is the string crossing. And this as a concept just seems such an, a, a, a good thing to do. So if you look um, in your 
sheet, which is slightly different layout to mine. Um, oh no, second line, where you've got a two bar rest. Can you see you've got a string crossing there? And this concept of backwards and forwards when you're string crossing. So that you, you feel like if you're doing this backwards and forwards, you can start to feel a circle. That's why it says circular vinyl aerobics this way, forward and back. And of course, if you go on a push bow on, in going up, that's clockwise. And if you start on a back bow, and go up one, it's anti-clockwise. Do you want to just try that with me? Because this, this is a really good concept to establish. Um, so let's, let's do, um, let's do the C to G string on a back bow, sort of in the middle of the bow, going C to G, C to G, like this, and feel like the back of your hand is going round in a circle. This is really relevant for what's coming. Can you feel how that's clockwise? Now let's do, um, now let's do, uh, let's do, um, I'll do E string. What about if we do, um, uh, hang on a bit, no, because that's tenors. Let's play the piece. I think we've got enough of the concept to get the round and roundness in the circle. So these are all things that we're thinking about with this piece. So we've got chordal fingering, we've got notes going up the C string, we've got wrist movement with the quavers, we've got the bow parallel to the bridge, and we've got the forward and backness going up and down your leg for string crossing. So let's play the piece. Okay, here we go. So good hand position, which we've hopefully established in elementary, enables us to get wrist up and get fingers right close together. <laughs> getting chordal fingering and one thing that I hadn't mentioned is to, the, you know practicing pizzicato as well because that's so useful to make sure you get a good sound even if you're a genius with a bow if your fingers aren't in the right place you haven't got a chance so um, you've got to get that pizzicato connection okay here we go I'm gonna stop talking now here we go ready three four <laughs> So most of you probably won't have played up the C string before like that, playing one, two, three, four, and then the G string. And I'm holding, holding my fourth finger down, third and fourth fingers down when I play the second finger. And um, so, Ibi, can we just have a look at the lower intermediate and just have a have a have a look at the the technique in that um, for the first one? Great, thank you. So if you could just move it down a bit so we can see the technique above it. Um, uh, probably down a bit, no, up a bit then. <laughs> At the top of the page, that's great. Yeah. So we're looking at taking the bow off the with the, um, with the tip of the third finger. And this is starting to use the fingers on the bow. Just the first concept of doing that. 
so that when you take the bow off the string, you're not gripping with your thumb and your first finger. So we did we, we did retakes in the brawl, didn't we? Um, but this is really thinking about how the weight of the bow rests on the third, the tip of the third finger, and how it's it's quite easy with the thumb just to um, manipulate the hair and move the bow. So you sort of feel like there's a sort of weightlessness, and it's all on that that fulcrum of the third finger. Um, uh, two octave um, scale and arpeggio, playing with dynamics. So always playing with dynamics um, and 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 slurs of quavers as well. So we did we did separate quavers, but s introducing slurs as well. Okay, so the other part of the technique of this level, um, can we go back to me? Do you think? Thank you. Um, is contracted fingering. And I first came across co contracted fingering um, in the Telemann A minor sonata when it goes. So you, you know, you can get up and down the vial without letting go. And as a modern cellist, I thought this was a real hoot because, you know, with, with cello, you go from here and your muscle memory takes you up there and you come back again and you know what you're doing because it's muscle memory and blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly you can get around the vial by not letting go. And I thought, this is such a revelation. This, this is amazing. Um, and, I, and I call this contraction technique and, and also crab technique. And my little symbol for this is sort of like an, an upside down V, if you like, because I feel that it, it pulls the fingers together. So if I just demonstrate it and, and where I would use it, um, let, me, let me just do that then. So a contraction is where, let's say, um, I've got a B and a D, and then what I want to do is to move my fourth finger onto C sharp. So what I'm going to do is put all the weight in my fourth finger, let everything go, including my thumb, and then put my fingers back in the new position. So um, when I do the Telemann, it, okay, it's very quick to see, but I'm putting fingers next to each other to come down the fingerboard, and you can use this technique from shifting from first to half position and, for, and half to first position. So if I show you um, a piece that I've got here called My Love Gave Me a Cherry from book three, um, I could do it like this. I could do a third finger on the C sharp, then shift back. But that's quite lumpy, isn't it? Um, and I want to have a fourth finger on this D. I could do the whole thing in half. But I've still got a problem then because I've got quarter fingering for two and three. Anyway, I want to do this in first position. So now I'm gonna do my contraction with a four. Move everything back. Then play an open D. So, you can see how contraction technique can get you not only up and down the vial, but also from half to first position. Just let me show you how useful it is on the treble. You can use the same technique, contract up. So I've gone from E to an A, to a G, to a C. Um, so using your fourth finger and putting all the weight in it, contracting your fingers together, including your thumb, putting your hand in a new position can really help you to get around without letting go. And, um, and being secure, because there's nothing worse than thinking, oh, I've got to go all the way down there, it's a long way. Um, but if you use contraction technique, it comes up all over the place. Once you start to see it, you think, oh yes, I get that. So I did E to A, all the weight in fourth finger. If anybody wants to try this, just do this with me. Then first finger on a G, fingers down in new position in diatonic fingering. Anyway, 
So this dynamics and and how you play with use the bow playing with dynamics and we've talked about um, bow distribution and how that all goes out the window when you start to think about dynamics well another way of playing quietly is to support the hair when you play and some of you might have this as your bow hold anyway um, but supporting the hair with the tech with the tip of the third finger when you take the bow off can also give you less pressure on the hair less pressure with the second finger so you play more quietly um, so that that's a sort of technique um, involved with this let's just do the fanfare again and think about the forward and backness of the bow and, um, and those notes going up the C string okay let's do that again here we go then ready and three four <laughs> questions after that um, that talk okay so what I'd like to do now is just talk to you about how on earth I came to write a technical syllabus for vials and up until that point I had been a cello teacher was still am a cello teacher um, teaching students um, children adults from grade 1 to grade 8 and when you work from a, a syllabus, which, you know, from time to time students do exams, so you work from a syllabus, you see that there are technical, technical requirements in each of the pieces which are, you know, progressive. So, um, so that gave me an understanding, in a way, of progression. So, so what I did was to take the feeling, and only the feeling, of the cello technique and the feeling of viol technique and convert the cello technique into viol technique, but but only the feeling of it. So, for example, I sort of thought it's more important to get a good hand position and be able to do thing, chordal fingering than it is to do extensions. Um, just just based on the viol and you know that that feeling of what it feels like to do an extension on a cello and an extension on the viol, and I thought it was preferable to get this hand position and the feeling of keeping fingers down. So that's just an example. Um, so as a member of the string department, so I was their viol teacher, um, and many head teachers have welcomed me, hello viol teacher, Got, have heard all the jokes. Um, as a member of the string department, um, we were involved in writing loads of planning sheets, and this was a government um, incentive that, the, that, that was sort of handed down, that we we had to show progression of an average child and, and anybody who taught music who's done anything in teaching knows the average child because there are just so many but <laughs> you know what i mean there are no average children um so it, it was quite a daunting task in a way but uh, having this directive from the government really did crystallize my ideas about how a child can progress and the thing about this is that you have to take tiny 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 steps um, and and then in the end um, make big ones but when you're teaching children you can never give them too much because they just switch off they always have to be in a way and you enable them you don't 
um, give them big tasks that they can't do. You enable them and praise them. And so, so it was a very sort of steady, detailed uh, pathway, really. So, and of course, this is all in line with the national curriculum. Um, so whatever I was doing on the viol, it was happening with, whoop, it was happening with violins and, and, and all the other woodwind instruments and, and all the other instruments as well. Um, so in Warwickshire, because we had so many children learning the viol, and I was there for 18 years, and at you know, different times we had different numbers of children, so we had, I guess, probably about uh, well four consorts. We had a junior consort, um, an intermediate consort, an area consort, and a county consort. And it was the county consort that you're going to hear from. They called themselves Gutted, uh, which I thought was a brilliant name. Anyway, so we had lots of children um, and lots of instruments because over a period of time we acquired something like 21 trebles, 7 tenors and 6 basses uh, by various means, me going into um, deprived areas and all, all sorts of things. Anyway, I'm not going to bore you with that now. And at different times we had two viol teachers apart from me, Jenny Curtis and Ali, Ali Kinder. So we had a huge range of, of children um, special needs both end of the spectrum we had the plodders and we had those who just devoured everything in double quick time who you get right out divisions for them and then you know that was it they could just play them first time we got those that could improvise those that couldn't well really struggled reading in a 4-2 time uh, with you know with a minimum beat we had autistic dyspraxic dyslexic concerto playing guinea pigs so I had lots of opportunities to try out what worked and what didn't work. Um, so let's hear from some of the students now. Um, over the years, I entered um, sorry about the block, um, my students in the National Festival of Music for Youth. So as soon as I had a consort, which was probably after about I don't know two years of playing. They were in the National Festival because it was it's such a good place to to get the viol out there into for thousands of children. It's it's a very high profile event, and and so I suppose um, I entered students for about sixteen years. Different groups, um, different consorts. Sometimes with contemporary music, sometimes with um, Alan Davis and his his recorder ensemble in Birmingham. But um, when I finished. Um, at the music service, the the um, the current gutted at that time in 2016, they won uh, the partnership award. And I'm going to show you some photos in a minute. Um, but you're first of all going to hear some some of their playing, um, which is the music for youth um, partnership award, and that meant that they could um, have a workshop of their with a, a prep work, uh, with a sorry a consort of their choice, and they chose prep work. And, and to record a CD, which they did, and that's what you're going to hear now. So I think, Ibby, um, we're going to play them uh, some Laws and some Bach, is that right? Jackie, I think we decided that the sound would be better coming from you, from your, from your end. Oh, did we? Aha, uh -huh. right, okay, I'll just, I'll just do a, sh a screen share then, hang on a minute. Um, oh, I'd forgotten that, hang on a minute, just let me find, I need to go into my computer and find the files, I've got all the photographs up. Well, maybe, maybe we'll do photographs first, actually, shall we? I'll do that first, because we've got them here. Okay. So, just as a... Oh, uh, here we are. So, <laughs> you can see, this, is, this was one of the pictures that we did that we always managed to do... Hang on a minute, if I, if I can move that across and see if I can give you the next picture. We always had so much fun lying on the floor. Um... This is at the Asphalt, Asphalt Festival. Oh, Jackie, sorry, we can't see the enlarged version of that picture. Okay. You can't see the enlarged picture. What can you see, Ibi? Oh, just, just a whole load of, of pictures. Thumbnail. Oh, okay. All yeah. right, then. Okay, I see I'm going to have to come out of them and do them separately, then. Hang on a minute. Let's close that one down. Okay. Right. Okay. So, um, so this is um, gutted in two thousand and ten. Uh, nope, still not working. No. Um, what about what about opening the 
the enlarged version first before you screen share. So if you come out of screen share, okay, and then open the album. Oh uh, right, okay. And and then screen share. Then we'll okay, get to see fine. the enlarged version. Okay. I think. Let's okay, try that. Fine. Let's go to this. So okay. How's that? Oh, not screen sharing yet. Hang on a minute. Screen share. How's that? Share. Hang on. That one. Yep, that's fine. Okay, so this is um, gutted in New York. Um, that was 2010, just busking in uh, in a park. That's one of the things that they did. Um, obviously, different students. So let me do. Um, this is. Can you see that one? Unfortunately, not. <laughs> okay, okay. I think I know what I've got to do. Don't worry. I'm going to stop. Does that mean I have to stop doing this on everyone then? Hang on a minute. Uh, didn't even, okay, let's just find. Let's just find. Let's have a look at this one. So every picture has got to be screen shared, doesn't it? Okay, right. Have a look at this one. Some people there you might recognise. <clears throat> this is gutted with uh, doing their workshop with. Um, Sam and Richard. Sam and Richard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, this isn't going to be as easy as I thought it was going to be, actually. Um, right, go back to here. This is gutted in, the, in their recording. You see that? Yeah, that's lovely. Show you some some younger ones. Every year that the festival of um, music was on in the Gambo Festival in Asphalt, we used to take a bunch of students. And this is um, I can't remember what year this was. Maybe 2012. You might recognise a certain young lady over here. Um, uh, and we just used to have such a lot of fun. Okay, and so that's outside Rans Cathedral. Right, I'm going to look for some um, audio tracks now, and let's have a listen to these. Um, and we're going to hear. Right, let me just share the screen. Right, where is it? Okay, hang on a minute. Oh, here we are, got the audio tracks. Here we are.
I'll just stop it there. And I just would quite like to play you um, some Bach that they really enjoy playing. Um, this is courtesy of Fretwork, by the way. Can you hear that? going to stop that there because we're not going to have enough time otherwise. So does anybody have any questions so far in about the technique that we've been talking about? Heather? Can I just go back to the contractual fingering? Yeah. When you've, you've, when you've uh, placed your fourth finger down, mm -hmm. you're bringing the others up are you leading with any particular finger or all the other fingers are coming down at the same time? Yeah, I think, I think the latter actually. If I'm right. Going, they're all just moving forward together, but I'm pivoting on my little finger. So yeah. all the weight is going into my little finger and then coming and the rest of the hands coming forward, including the thumb. Does that right. Does that answer your question? Yes, I just, I just wondered whether, whether they all had to come down at exactly the same time, all the others. Um, or are you leading with your, with your strong I think, finger? If I think about it, my first finger is coming down. My first finger is going to the place where the new place where it wants to go, and then I'm, um, but but not particularly. Right, okay, thank you. Yeah, that's okay. Right, so there's quite a lot of technique in the lower intermediate, but let's move on to intermediate now. And this is where, um, because with cello about this level, it's where you start to introduce vibrato. And this is where I wanted to introduce playing, um, using bow tension to shape notes, so playing a messa de voce. Um, so doing simple things like um, turning my wrist and pressing down on the hair towards the floor with one bow. And that seemed to me like, because we're trying to keep equivalent to, to other instruments, it was really important to be able to shape notes without bow speed to make a difference between dynamics with bow speed and bow tension. And that seemed really important for this level. So if I was gonna do the beginning of Dos Memoir or something. Um... And you can see I'm moving my bow pretty much at the same time, but you can hear sort of notes, you know, coming, you know, shaped carrots, I call them, you know, two carrots together. Um, so that, that seemed like a really important thing at this level. And also to start shifting um, down to the top fret. Um, and this next piece, I Care Not For These Ladies, has, has a shift, doesn't it, in the second section. So if you're playing treble, this is where you would go um, into diatonic fingering. So for treble this level, it's diatonic fingering um, playing, you know, tones and semitones. So if we, if we have a, let's just play through this piece and then we'll see if we can make it better by some of the other technique at this level. Okay, so here we go. So, one, two.
quite a bit in that, isn't there? Now, because you've done bow distribution and you know uh, the best place to be on the bow for an upbeat is near the tip, every time you start at the beginning here, you're going to readjust your bow and play a back bow at the tip. And because you've worked on a good bow direction on the top string, you're going to get a good sound. Now, how do we get these dotted rhythms to sound beautiful? Again, it's about bow distribution, isn't it? If I want to have a, a graceful, elegant dotted note, I'm going to play the first note with a longer bow and the next two notes with a shorter bow. So just do that with me on the A string. So a long bow, this is a dotted rhythm that we've got here, which is this. So we have a push bow for the long notes and then a pull and a push for the short notes. Halfway down the bow and then we're going to come back with another long note and push bow and pull bow, like this. And can you see how we're just doing this with the bow? Without the left hand. So now if we played it um, with the left hand, if we did, uh, let's do uh, the dotted rhythm, the last dotted rhythm, so the last one, two, three bars. So with me then, and one, Two. And again, really thinking about that long note and then the shorter notes with the shorter bows. And one, two. But can you see how it, it really sounds quite elegant when you use a little bow for a little note? And I know that's a really easy, simple concept, but sometimes it, it gets overlooked, and you sometimes I hear this. It doesn't sound half as elegant, does it? Um, so I forgot to say the tenor part probably, uh, sorry, has a missing repeat at the end of bar four. So let's just have a look at the shift then, because I've got up there from a shift. This is the second bar of the second phrase, the second section got up there with a, a two so if you're practicing that you're going to have to do that over and over again with your eyes closed to make sure that your muscle memory is 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 being used because there's no point doing this because if you look at your left hand you can't look at the music and if anything you should be looking at your bow not your left hand but then look at the contracted fingering to come back because we've got a two. This is only for basses. Trebles, you're in diatonic fingering, and I don't think you're shifting on tenors for this, but you would do. Tenors, if you think about this as being similar to B flat C D on the G string of the tenor on the top fret, that will give you the same sort of notes. Um, so we're up there on a G. Contraction, we've done an extension back contracting with the fourth finger so I put my first finger on F natural and G with the fourth finger and down that way so it's back to this this crab walking thing again isn't it so let's play this again and um, and see if we can remember when we're doing the dotted notes also to do a crescendo and a diminuendo that you've got marked in your copy um, and when you play the first section on the repeat Let's have it really quietly and think about maybe supporting the bow hair with your little finger. So you're taking the weight of the bow, perhaps moving the bow less so that you don't get um, so much sound. Okay, let's do this together then. Okay, here we go. And one, two. <laughs>
So I wondered if you spotted my deliberate mistake of missing out the two back bows um, just before the forte and the F on the Fs, but don't worry if you didn't. Um, I wonder how many of you got the, when you went back, had a long note. I remember to do an up bow, a back bow when we went back. Getting down the bow, getting back. Again, it's a very basic technique, being on the right place at the right time on the bow. Whether it's push and pull is quite a small part of the detail. I'm not saying it's not important, it's incredibly important, but actually being on the right place on the bow, because if I was to do an upbeat here, it's not going to sound great, is it? If I'm at the heel for a short note. And I know you know this, but actually it's doing it when you're doing everything else, isn't it? Um, so I finished the last three bars. Take the bow off, put it down again. Without it going, bounce. So th those are the concepts that um, we're thinking about for the intermediate level. There's, um, Ibby, can you get the sheet up for intermediate? We just have a very quick look. Because this is where I introduce extensions. Slurs over three notes. Um, working up and down the bow, which is what I was saying about bow distribution, working up and down the bow so that we, um, you don't have lots of lumpy notes, that you, everything in a way is considered. So yeah, you can see extension string crossing over four strings. We're going to talk about string crossing in a minute, actually. I'm just uh, careful of the time. Uh, so sight reading with chordal fingering is at this level. So if you've got um, two to three, fine. You've got to sight read now a three to two at this level. So you're really starting to try and read ahead and spot where the chordal fingering comes in consort music and and things like that. So that that's a sort of what one of the the you know one of the technical points at this level that that I introduced. Okay, let's look at the inter the upper intermediate. So we've got this arbol and we're just going to play the first part of the, um, the sonata. And I'd quite like to play it first and then and then talk about it. Um, oh no, actually, what we might do, because I've just seen play off the frets here. Yeah. Okay, maybe we're just going to just have a little tangent going off here. Um, playing off the frets and playing a different clef for your instrument. Um, again, shifting on the cello is, is, is really important. And I think shifting on the viol early on is important to give you confidence. So one of the things I like to do here is to think about playing off the frets, not necessarily going to the frets, but finding your place, and playing a really easy tune. to get the finger placements of what it's like to play off the frets and it it doesn't have to be a scary place and of course if you're playing off the frets it's forcing you to move your bow down towards the bridge which is giving you extra bow control so what I did then I started with a C on the E string off the frets um, you could you can try this at home on your own I'm conscious of the time so I'd like to get on and play the arbor now, but that's one of the things at this level that I would expect to be doing. Okay, let's play this. Um, about that speed. Yeah? Oh, here we go then. Ready? And one, two.
quite a lot of things there to cover. So we've got string crossing across three strings, haven't we, at speed? Bringing out the moving parts. And because we're string crossing, and we did string crossing in fanfare, we're using a sensible part of the bow. If I was going to be doing string crossing at the tip, can you see how much harder it is? And yet if I move my bow along, there are other sort of tricks we can do as well. We're not doing those now, but we were doing forward and back, fast string crossing, we're not going to be at the tip. Basic concept for this level. Um, so we've got chords. Um, if I was going to learn this and I wasn't sure about double stopping with, or, or chords, then I could practice them without the left hand, which is what we did before. And, and I know that, you know, that takes some while to work out what I just did there, but, you know, you can see the concept that getting the bow going forward and back and playing the double stops, and then I can do the pizza, can do the le left hand pizzicato. Etc. So that's that's a, another way of practicing this, isn't it? Um, um, let's just have a think about where we go from string crossing. Because another, another concept and a very important concept with viol playing is the resonance, isn't it? And, and how do you go from one end of the viol to the other without um, with, with making the viol resonant, without a great big lump, without taking the bow off? So this is bar four, that I'm, uh, three I'm thinking about here, where we go down to here. And because we're all sensible viol players, we wouldn't do this, oh, this next D with a with an open. We're going to reduce our string cross and do it with a four. But can you see I'm not doing this. Could you hear that I stopped the bow on the string and then rocked it round. What I'm doing is getting on the string then rocking off the string. So I've got a fair amount of pressure holding the horse hair on coming off the string and landing on the next string. So do you want to try that with me now and try it from the from the fifth string to the fourth string and see if you can land on the fourth string and still keeping the fifth string ringing. Don't don't play the fourth string. Just just land on it. Now go to the third string and see if you can still make your fifth string ring when you land on it. And thinking about that forward and back thing that we talked about right back in, in lower intermediate. And now go to the second string. So you can see I'm not taking the bow off and putting it back on again. I'm keeping contact with the string. But because I'm rocking around quite fast, and landing on the string I need, you can't hear the strings in the middle. It's silent. And in a way, the more pressure that you have on the bow, the less sound you make. If you don't have so much pressure, it's quite easy to hear the notes in the middle. So if we do um, bar, oh, one, two, three, it is bar four. Um, let's just do that bar together. Here we go. One, two. So maybe go to the A string, but don't play the note, so we can still hear the G string ringing. Here we go, one, two, and again. So really thinking about that forward and back. L let's just have a look at the shift now on uh, in bar eight. Um, sorry, tennis, this isn't a shift for you. <coughs> um, trebles, you're going into diatonic fingering here to get to that top A. Bases straight up to an F sharp. This is where, um, just doing this, just doing that shift over and over again, learning how to measure 
the notes. We started to go to the top fret, so we're recognising the shift here on the on the two frets. Um, let's just play that again. And with another thing here, we've got slurs, three note slurs. <laughs> again is another sort of concept to introduce at this level. Okay, here we go. So let's play this again. Ready? And one, two. <laughs> and lots of things to think about um, technically and Ibi if you could um, get up the really useful aspects of developing the developing technique sheet um, I'm hoping that we can just I can just talk you through it I'm aware that it's um, 25 to 9 um, and so you can see that a progression of technique that if you do one thing in a certain way then it can really help all the stuff that follows afterwards Right, so if we look at the left hand, Ooh, that's quite big. Anyway, um, let's look at the left hand. So first of all, we've got a hand shape. So we just we decided that a good hand shape was a good idea, didn't we? Because it helps to play off the frets in tune as well. That looks good. Zoom to fit looks good. Perfect. Thank you. Finger placement. So just making sure that your fingers are in a good position to play um, with a good tone, because finger placement is really important for tone, as I mentioned. Uh, so practicing pizzicato is a good idea. Um, holding fingers down on adjacent and non-adjacent strings. So that you know, when every time you change string, the only thing that moves is your bow, not your finger. As a basic concept, that's that's really something to remember. I'll just say it again because it's quite important. If you string change, it's only your bow that moves. I've still got my string down because I've got I've got the resonance of the next of the previous string. So with that goes into chordal fingering I can still hear the G because I'm playing G A B C and still leaving my second finger down so that that really helps I think that chord pro that progression there you see hand shape finger placement holding fingers down chordal fingering and then arpeggios and chords so you can see there's a definite progression there let's look at the shifting Shifting has, in a way, has a lot to do with how you feel your fingers on the fingerboard. Um, we've talked about contracted fingering, haven't we, and how you, have, you transfer your weight from one side of your hand to the other, and that enables you to move up. Um, and that, um, if we just go on to number four, it, it has an effect on... Um, if, you're, if you're trying to shift and all your fingers are glued to the fingerboard, because your thumb is very is bent outwards and your fingers are tight then how on earth do you shift so if you think about how you shift if i'm going to go to the top fret say on a bass or, or a tenor or a treble um, i'm aiming for the top fret what i'm going to be doing is moving on a strong finger and landing on a weak and i can do that if i just um if I think about that, if I think about my whole hand going and my whole hand is glued because it's all so tense, um, it makes it very hard to shift. So what's what's at the bottom of that, Ibi? Let's just have a look. There's, there's a few more things. Oh yeah, and then and then shifting with an extended fingering position. 
So here we move our first finger um, a semitone and a thumb a tone. And that's, that, that again is part of the progression. If you're thinking about shifting, how you shift, where your thumb is relative to your fingers. Um, if you look down in the middle one, then we've got placement of, of extensions and placement of the thumb. That's maybe something to think about when you put your hand on, having your thumb bent out, as I just mentioned. Um, if we look at the right hand, we've got um, lots of things to consider with the bow. <clears throat> so bowing legato, making sure that you've got good contact, using the wrist, a really nice relaxed arm and being aware of um, arm weight. Um, we've talked about bow distribution and dynamics and how bow distribution, you can separate your bow out and then when you play with it, with it play loud, you're using more bow or less bow. Um, dynamics and bow speed and then dynamics, um, sorry, dynamics and bow speed and then we've got bow angle and distance from the bridge because that's also something else to think about, isn't it? These are just technical things that you can maybe take a bit of music and say, oh, what am I, am I doing all of these things? Uh, right, so the correct place on the bow, so playing on a back bow at the tip, um, things like that, and dynamic, so doing messa de voces with bow hair tension. Um, and then with that, we've got playing fast and how you play fast and playing from the shoulder um, Realising your arm weight, having a flexible wrist, having good contact with the hair. So when, when you play fast, you're still flexible with your wrist, but you've got second finger down on the hair. Um, and fingering, open string or fourth finger, that's always something to think about when you're playing fast, because you always want the maximum amount of notes on one string. So. There's a lot of things to think about there, and I've left probably about five minutes for questions. Does anybody have any questions? You must be slightly bamboozled now, because I've given you lots to think about. Farley. Um, when you're, I had a question about when you're Here in the class, yes, and you have the different sizes, the, the tenors, the basses, the trebles, how does it work in class? Do you just play in fourths or? Oh, no, no. Well, no, no, not at all, no. Um, in a consort class, then everybody, you know, either groups of treble tenor basses have their own music. And, um, and then as they progress through the consorts, then they reduce numbers. So by the time they're um, on an intermediate or an, an advanced consort, they would be one to a part. Oh, I see. I, I've been had to teach just everyone all at once, just the vial and uh, without any particular uh, music. And I ended up sometimes just using four strings, like, and just tuning the, the tenor down, just using A, E, um, yeah. C, and, and just to, so that everybody's playing the same pitch. Yes, I, I, think, I, think, that's, I think that could, could work. I think it might might be confusing for the tenor players, but it, but, you, but I think well, one of the nice the things about down. but but about playing in consort is the different harmonies. Um, so simple music, but in, in harmony. Mm -hmm. um, I, what about uh, from the beginning, starting kids with chords and progressions for the hand position, just as if you're teaching a guitar or. a ukulele class yeah <laughs> does that work or is it put too much tension on their hands um i haven't taught um chords at um a basic level because i think the bowing implication is is too hard it's t just trying to keep the bow on one string at a time and and get a good sound so mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't introduce chords um unless you were doing them sort of you know like that um, <laughs> Um, That's how we do it, just pizzicato. Yeah, well, I think that could be very rewarding, actually. If, if you're just strumming like that. Yeah, I guess I guess it puts the vial, you're, you're thinking about it from a chordal point of view. Mm -hmm. This is a nice idea. Um, uh, I've got a question. Oops. Um, 
Oh, 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 what's it's Elaine? I, I'm down as Josephine. Um, oh, 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 sorry, oh, there's one next to me. Um, at what stage did your bass players learn to play in the alto clef? Um, pretty much um, intermediate. Um, so the piece. Oh, um, yeah, the one we've just done is in the alto and I'm thinking gosh have they got that far yeah I, yeah I think so because you know we're talking to so the the, the arbol that we did yeah that they would do that in um, in alto clef um, and then the the, um, the students that did that would do that for GCSE right um, and and would do it on a treble as well uh, in treble clef but yes, I think I think introducing clefs just and very often, you know, you give you give a student a clef and say, play this and they go, OK. <laughs> it's not like that when you're old. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. Yeah, I know it's I know it's hard, harder, much harder. Um, but, student, but young young students tend to just look at it and go, oh, OK, so that's a note different. All right, then. OK. You know, are they, are they, they astound me or they astounded me. Yeah. Um, some of them but so think, you're not you're not doing this anymore i mean you're not teaching in warwickshire anymore no i'm not no 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 thank you elaine um roxanne has a question yeah yeah hi jackie completely hi. tangential this is from the picture of gutted busking in new york <laughs> because you always you always think of vials as being so temperamental and and you know, you're thinking you would never take a vial outside into the weather and the sunshine. Oh, we, we've been all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And well, we have tried, obviously tried to keep them out of the sunshine, but um, it was a hot day actually when we were busking in that park, but they went to Ellis Island and and, and all sorts. We, and we joined up with the Viola de Gamma Society in America and did a concert with um, John Mark Rosendahl. And, and unfortunately the photographs are, they're there, but I think it's just taking too much time to show you them. But okay. um, no, it was fine. And, you know, carting them around, you know, taking the children to France on, on, on the train. And uh, it's just, it's just all part of it, really. Okay, so, so, so the viol is kind of a slightly tougher instrument than you think, and it can be done. No, of course, yeah, it's like any instrument. Okay. It, it's just, it's just normal. If you're a viol player, you're a viol player, you're a cellist, you're a cellist. It's all the same. Okay. All right. Okay, bye. There's certainly going to be vile busking going on in Stratford upon Avon then. I'm pleased to hear it. It has been done. Go before. for it. It has been done before, okay. Roxanne. Ah, it has okay. Been done. Yeah. Well, and yeah. they're very generous in Stratford as well, actually. <laughs> Especially so long as you're not amplified, they think you're wonderful. <laughs> right, thank you very much, everybody. Any other questions? I think we should call it a day because it's way past supper time here in the UK. So um, thank you very much, Jackie. And thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And I'll see you next time. OK, thank you, everyone. Take care. Take okay, care. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.